and it's taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, and here is the word of God. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. The word of the Lord, please be seated. Friends, I would like to welcome all of you, especially those of you who are new um, with us, visiting the church for the first time. We are in the middle of a series called Redeeming the Ruins, the gospel in the uh, city of Corinth, in the church of Corinth, and we are now looking at uh, chapter 2, 1 to 5, and the title of this sermon is Why Preaching Does Not Change lives and the answer is because not so much preaching is no longer relevant in the 21st century i mean if you imagine especially after the pandemic right there are not many institutions in the world which will ask you to sit and listen to a 30 minute monologue without a chance to interrupt or to interject or to ask questions, right? Even at uh, universities across Australia, after the pandemic, I know this because I teach at university, we were told, we were instructed, no more lectures. Do not lecture at students, asking them to sit for 30 minutes, especially if it's longer. Put all of those lectures on recording and we're going to have interactions when you have face-to-face meetings. Which means preaching is always considered a a way to make people so completely bored, right? It's completely irrelevant. And that's why you thought, oh, so the answer of why preaching does not change lives because preaching is no longer relevant. But if you remove preaching, from the church, right, you actually throwing the baby out with the bath water, so to speak, because, uh, and a lot of churches actually do that today. They replace preaching with things like reflections or church productions, drama, skit, uh, special occasion um, in, in Christmas time, and so on and so forth. But if that's what they do, they deviate from God's will, because God speaks when the word is preached. There is a unique place of preaching in the purpose of God. Our Lord himself, Jesus Christ, made preaching the primary thrust of his ministry. In Luke 4, 18, 19, for example, he said that the Spirit of God is upon me to proclaim the good news, right? And the apostles give priority to the work of preaching and to prayer, Acts 6, 2, and 4. And preaching is so central. It is an indispensable means by which God advances the gospel throughout the world and builds his church. Now, obviously, God uses many other means to convey the truth of his word, one-on-one discipleship, group Bible study, personal examples, classroom teachings, books, discussions, and so on and so forth. But preaching stands as God's primary means for his voice to be heard in the world. Preaching is a personal, passionate plea in which God speaks as Christ is proclaimed from the scriptures. And that's why Paul said, we are therefore ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, through the preachers. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, Second Corinthians 5.20. In fact, the word preaching actually 
you can see in verse 4 that you read before the word preaching kerygma preaching really means a herald so if you imagine a town crier you know a, a, a herald an officer sent by a king if you have watched um, movies from the uh, centuries that gone by you will see a king sending um, his herald to announce to the townspeople what's uh, going to happen, right? And when the king actually, the king's herald opens that scroll, everyone is, uh, are on their knees, and then the herald will um, uh, proclaim the king's uh, wishes and commands. That's basically what preaching is. So in, in, in this uh, morning's um, preaching, I will give you one big idea with two parts, and here is the big idea in the next slide. Preaching does not change lives because the message is not focused on the cross and the method does not rely on the spirit. This is why a lot of preaching does not have any impact whatsoever. It's not so much the preaching that's wrong, but it's because the preaching does not have a focus on the cross and is not delivered by reliance on the Spirit. So let's look at uh, the two-part big idea. The first one is when the message is not focused on the cross. Paul said, when I came to you, and this obviously referred to the first time he came to Corinth, which you can read in Acts 18, uh, verse 1 to 17. And God sent Paul to Corinth after he um, went from Athens, um, the city of Athens, to uh, build a church in that city. But he, he wrote there, when I came to you brothers, or brethren, you know, male and female, uh, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, with superior speech or logos, and with superior wisdom. You know, the word wisdom um, comes from the word Sophia, right? So it reminds us of um, the word philosophers, right? Which really means lover of wisdom. Now, com- this is completely different, obviously, from um, the people of Paul's day who love rhetoric so much, right? If you remember don't know if you have done, done uh, Philosophy 101 or any other um, logic um, courses at uni, but you, would, uh, you may have encountered Aristotle's rhetorical principles in the next slide. Here is the summary, right? What, what the world thinks is the best way to communicate your message. Use this three-prong uh, approach. Use ethos, logos, and pathos. This is a kind of a three ways to persuade people, but you have to use all of them. Ethos is about credibility, right? Establishing your authority, your credibility to speak on any subject. Whereas logos is your rational appeal, your logical argument to you, for your point. And pathos is your attempt to sway your audience using emotional appeals. Let me give you an example. Ethos is used when you say something like this. Guys, buy my old car because I am a pastor. You can believe me that uh, this is a reliable car, right? And, uh, and, 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 and just trust me. And I'm trying to use my credibility, right, so that um, I'm not going to con you into buying uh, a broken car, right? But if I say... Buy my old car because yours is broken and mine is on sale and within your budget and it's pre-loved and well-maintained. I'm using logos. I'm using rational appeals to get you to buy my car. And if I use pathos, I would say something like this. Buy my old car or I will be evicted from my apartment at the end of the month. Right? If, if, If you have pity on me, um, buy my old car so that I can use the money to, buy, to, to uh, pay for my rent until the end um, of the month. See, if I use all those three in combination, 
I could probably get you to buy my old car, right? Ethos, Logos, and Pathos. But Paul did not use any of these in lieu of the gospel. So let me uh, qualify that statement. Paul did use a lot of these techniques, but not to replace the gospel of Jesus Christ. The simple message is always there. A more contemporary example of what the world uses to communicate message is, uh, for example, in the next slide, um, stated in this book, um, in the next slide, please, um, the nine public speaking secrets of the world's top minds. I don't know if you have read this book. I've um, done a review of this book, right? So in, in it, you will find um, tips like use storytelling, because stories are just data with a soul. Or have a conversation, right? If you want to um, persuade people, use uh, volume, pitch, pauses, all those in variation. Or how about have a jaw-dropping moment? You know, like when Steve Jobs said that, do you want to have a thousand songs in your pocket when he obviously uh, introduced iPod? many, many moons ago. Or use humor, right? Use humor with analogies and metaphors, uh, quotes and videos, and so on and so forth. And use them in combination so that you can uh, have a buy-in fr from people. See, these are all the techniques that we all use, and we are all um, aware of that. But Paul, Paul said, I actually did not use superior speech did not use superior wisdom so that I can focus on simple message that is Jesus and him crucified. So he was not so much an orator who entertains with superior speech, nor a philosopher who fascinates with practical wisdom, but he is a witness, a witness who proclaimed the testimony of God. Now, obviously, this is not an excuse for preachers to be lazy and careless in their preaching preparation so that uh, there is no diligent preparation, there's no clear articulation, there's no persuasive presentation. What is meant by Paul when he said, I do not use lofty wisdom and speech, is that the effects of people listening they're not going to say, what a marvelous preacher. But yet they would say, what a marvelous savior. See, these are the two polar opposite effects. Right? If you use all those techniques that Aristotle and the uh, modern writers give you, the people who hear the sermon will go away saying, he's such a marvelous speaker. That's not the goal at all. Paul said, um, that I just want to preach Christ crucified. So the effect should be what a marvelous Savior instead. And we go to the next slide. Proclaiming the testimony of God. That's what he basically uh, is saying. The word testimony is a legal word that refers to something that one presents in a court of law. And Paul is so conscious that God's is a judge. He was speaking in the presence of a judge and he was presenting his witness. So Paul was not preaching his testimony about God, but he was preaching God's testimony about God. What is the testimony of God? Well, God testifies to us that we are totally and entirely lost by nature, that there is no hope, no help for us but in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why, for example, in other places, in Acts 20, 27, to the elders in the city of Ephesus, Paul said, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. Friends, this is why expository preaching is so important. Right? Expository preaching is what we do every Sunday from this pulpit in this church. Expository Preaching is preaching where the main point of the biblical text is the main point of the sermon being preached. Let me repeat that again. 
expository preaching occurs when the main point of the text that we are looking at is the main point of the sermon. Because there are other sermons that just look at one topic and then you sprinkle that topic with all sort of different verses rather than looking at a particular passage in depth. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, preaching is theology coming through a man who's on fire. That's basically what expository preaching is. So here is an application. I was reminded by a few good people in this church that remember the applications for people. So here is an application for you. How, if, if you are trying to find a good church, right, what are some of the things that you have to be mindful of if you want to find a good church? Well, no matter what other criteria you apply, make sure you have this one criteria. Does the church merely teach biblically themed messages or does the church do expository preaching of the entire Bible? Now, the easiest way to answer that is to review the last three to six months of its preaching calendar. And you can go to the church website typically for that. Is it filled by multiple series aimed at various topical issues, you know, how to have a happy life, how to have a fulfilling marriage, how to have an enduring relationship, a successful career, how to be great parents, and so on and so forth. Right? That's the how-to sermons. Or is the church taking time to simply teach the whole counsel of God, going through books of the Bible one by one? That is a sign of God's church. You know why? Because if that's what you do, if that's what a church does, that means we believe that the curriculum that God has designed in the 66 books in the Bible is the best curriculum. You don't have to invent all these themes and then fit the congregations and hope that they build their faith. But you trust in the curriculum that God himself has designed for us. And that's why at the moment we are going through the book of First Corinthians. So that you understand the context in the uh, uh, original um, um, letter and how it applies to us. Friends, today we celebrate the Reformation Sunday. Not Halloween Sunday, but Reformation Sunday, which is way more important, right? 31st October 1517 was the birth of Reformation 507 years ago. And one of the Reformation slogan is Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Now, let me just use this moment because it's uh, the right moment for Reformation Sunday to mention this. Sola Scriptura does not mean that all truth of every kind is found in the Scripture alone. Scripture is not the only source of truth for everything because we still need textbooks, right? You still need your physics textbook. You still need your management textbooks at uni. You still need IKEA manual so that you can build the chairs or the desk that you get from IKEA. Sola Scriptura has to do with the sufficiency of Scripture as our supreme authority, not the only, but it's the highest, the supreme authority in all spiritual matters. So sola scriptura simply means that the Bible contains all the truth necessary for our salvation and spiritual life that is taught explicitly or implicitly in the 66 books that God has given to us. We recite the Apostle Creed every Sunday in this church, and it's called the Apostle Creed not because it was produced by the Apostle, but because it contains a brief summary of their teaching. The faith that was once delivered uh, to the saints in the history of the church has been assaulted in many different ways. Some overly, overtly deny the gospel truth, some add it to the truth of God, and some ignore the responsibility to become grounded in a doctrine. Let me give you an example from, from the Reformation um, era. In fact, this was 100 years before uh, 1517, before Martin Luther came to the States. 
a guy called Jan or Jan Hus. In the next slide, you see his uh, um, image there. Jan Hus was born uh, in 1369 um, in, um, in Czech, Czech Republic today, and his name actually meant a uh, goose, right? In the kingdom of Bohemia, he was born. And he was a renowned preacher at a church called Bethlehem Chapel. And what, that's not the only thing he did. He spent a lot of his time serving as an academic, as the dean of the philosophical uh, faculty in Prague. Quite amazing, right? Uh, 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 an academic and also a preacher. Uh, he was also a political activist because he lived in a time of social unrest between the German um, um, speakers and the Czech citizens and become a national figure in the Czech nationalism. But he had this deep conviction that the scripture alone is the ultimate, the supreme authority over all our life and faith. Over and above the church authority, which at the time, his view was considered a threat by the papal authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Jan Hus was immediately thrown into prison for six months because of that belief that the scripture is the supreme authority over our lives. He was given a mock trial, a kangaroo trial, and he was ordered to recant, to um, let go all his beliefs, to, to remove all his beliefs. Obviously, he refused. And in July 1415, he was uh, stripped. He was given a hat painted with devils, and he was labeled arch heretic. And as they uh, prayed at him, past a burning pile of his books, and then chained him uh, to the stake, he was praying for his enemies. And in response to being chained up like a dog, he said this, My Lord Jesus Christ was bound with a harder chain than this one for my sake. So why should I be ashamed of this rusty chain? And he was given one more opportunity to uh, recant uh, his belief, but he refused. He proclaimed, what I thought with my lips, I will now seal with my blood. And that he did. On December 17, 1999, about five years ago, or oh, 25 years ago, Pope John Paul II addressed a crowd in Czech Republic expressing deep regret for the cruel death inflicted upon their hero. After Haas was finally condemned to, die, to death, before he actually had his last breath, he proclaimed, you may roast the goose, but a hundred years from now, a swan will rise whose singing you will not be able to silence. This is not a prof prophecy uh, per se, but actually God in his sovereign mercy actually um, heard the prayer of Jan Hus. You know, 100 years after he died, Martin Luther came to the States. 1415, he died. 1517, there was a guy called Martin Luther, among 102 years later, who nailed 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door, and he too was led to challenge the deviation from the word of God, and he too was condemned as a heretic. Here is an application for you. Step up as Christian believers. Don't just master the word of God. You have to be mastered by the word of God. Don't just know the word of God, but you have to be gripped by it so that you have a deep conviction that not only I know the word of God in my head, but my priorities in life, my decisions in life are steered and shaped by the word of God to the point that I'm willing to lay down my time, energy, and also life for the sake of that word of God. And at the center of that God's testimony and is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The next slide, please. This is uh, verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ 
and him crucified. Friends, I want you to pay attention to the word decided there. Obviously, Paul weighed and deliberated and considered all the issues, and then he made a decision. He decided not to know anything. Obviously, this is a hyperbole, you know, that, that way of saying, because in this letter, 1 Corinthians, he talked about a lot of things. He talked about, um, you know, Lord's Supper. He talked about unity. He talked about a lot of subjects. But when he said, I decided to know nothing, that really means that the most important thing of all is Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, the gospel, the death of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ, that is the main thing. And let's keep the main thing, the main thing. He was not going to use gimmicks or clever approaches, but simply give people a clear presentation of the gospel. Because the key to effective preaching is not articulate speech, but a crucified Savior. The gospel is not a form of wisdom. It's not a form of philosophy. Because no human wisdom, no human mind would ever dream up God's scheme for redemption through a Messiah who died like a criminal on the cross. It's too preposterous. It's too humiliating for a God. And only God is so wise as to be so foolish to have that kind of a idea to save humans. So friends, the testimony of God from Genesis to the Revelations, at the center of it is the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus himself, in Luke 24 to 27, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So if you read Genesis, make sure that leads you to Jesus Christ. If you, lead, uh, if you read something from um, um, the Revelations or Obadiah or Sephania, whatever book and passages you read in the Bible, make sure you understand that this is about none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the only way in which death is destroyed, sin is conquered, righteousness is established, Rebels are reconciled, saints are sanctified, and heaven is opened. The gospel is God's mer message of mercy to miserable sinners like us. The gospel is the message of grace to unworthy sinners like us. And the uh, gospel is the message of warning for unrepentant sinners like us. And the gospel is also God's message of encouragement for needy sinners like us. So friends, that's why we preach the gospel every Sunday. In the next slide, if you ask me, how come at ICC Melbourne there is no revival service? Because revival services, it occurs every Sunday in this church, not just twice a year. The gospel is being preached every Sunday so that unbelievers who died in their sin are being resurrected by the gospel. And believers who are spiritually asleep are being awakened by the gospel every Sunday. You know why? Because every story in the Bible whispers the name of Jesus. We are about gospel-centered, not advice-centered preaching. The Christian life is not do-it-yourself model, how to raise a family, how to manage your finance, how to cut down stress at work. No, it's about how Jesus Christ has done what you couldn't possibly do, and in his power, you will have that grace and mercy that you need in every single challenge in your life. So friends, why preaching does not change lives? Because the message is not focused on the cross of Jesus Christ. The second and final point is that, in the next slide, preaching does not change life because the methods does not rely on the Spirit of God. Paul said, when I was with you, I came in weakness and in fear. And he might be talking 
about the thorn in his flesh that he mentioned later in 2 Corinthians 12, or perhaps the tough ministry that he had, um, you know, his imprisonment in Philippi, he was being driven out from Berea, he was rejected in Athens. He experienced all these difficulties. But when he said that his speech and message were not in words of wisdom, he did not say that he was anti-intellectual, because don't forget that Paul was a well-educated rabbi. He would have uh, been able to speak um, at least four different languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, a leading authority of the Sanhedrin party. So if Paul wanted to show his intellect, he certainly knew how to do it. But that's not his approach. He instead just proclaimed the testimony of God that centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he said, I did all this in demonstration in the spirit, uh, of the Spirit and of power. This is the first that summarizes why Paul was successful in spreading the gospel throughout the entire Roman Empire. Not his wisdom, not his speech, but the demonstration of the Spirit power. What does it, what does it like if the Spirit actually demonstrates his power? Well, you can see, for example, an example given in Acts 16, um, 14. It says this, uh, one who heard us, who heard Paul preaching, was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart. See, that's what happened. If the preaching is done in demonstration of the Spirit's power, the Lord open the hearts of the listeners. Not the speaker, but the Lord himself in his spirit. Because the word of cross is being spoken, and the sword of the spirit is actually at work. So friends, what we need today in our era is a cross-eyed preacher and spirit-reliant preacher, not motivational speaker, Paul would not make it in a TED Talk uh, stage, perhaps. He did not promise uh, prosperity or tell people how to live their best life now. Instead, he's basically saying, I tell you all about Jesus on the cross. Now, any questions? And that is a powerful message. Now, let me close with a story. Evangelist Billy Graham um, once told a story about a police officer on a night duty in northern England. And as he walked the streets, he suddenly heard a cry. And he quickly got his flashlight out, and then he saw a boy sobbing on the steps near a park. And then he asked, son, are you okay? And he said, sir, I'm lost. Please take me home. The police officer said, I will be gladly take you home, taking you home. Where do you live? He was so scared. He was uh, completely lost. He was terrified. He couldn't remember his home address. So the police officer started to name streets after streets, and the boy kept um, looking down um, the concrete and did not um, respond he was just saying like that, no, no, and no. And the police officer started to name shops and um, other uh, points of interest in the town, and he said, no, no. And then the police officer rem uh, remembered something. How about the church in the center of the town? There was a white cross that towered high above the entire town. And the boy suddenly had his face brightened and, and he, his eyes were lit up and he saw the police officer and he said, I know that. The police officer said, do you live near that church? And the boy replied, sir, take me to the cross and I will find my way home. 
Friends, that is the message that the church is uniquely equipped, like no other institutions in this world, to proclaim to everyone, to you today as well. Because if you go to the cross, the cross will lead you home to God. If you are hurting, if you are angry, if you are in despair, if you are being confused by all these philosophies and teachings and wisdoms of the world, come to the cross. It will lead you home to God. Come and see the Savior who was crucified. And at the feet of the cross, you will understand that there is something that has been missing all these years in my life. I've been trying to search that thing that can fulfill my heart, but I keep getting disappointed time and again. And come to Christ, and you will find that He is the answer that can satisfy your soul. Because there's this hole in our heart, this, this, this heart uh, um, vacuum that can only be filled by Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Would you do that? Let's pray. Father, we